Let's open with a word of prayer, so. <laughs> Father, once again, we are gathered here together because we love you, we love your word, we love your people, and we want to be instruments in your hands. We want to be agents of your grace and truth. And what we're going to talk about this morning um, is probably some of the darkest, darkest things that happen within your church. So give us the ability to think clearly about these things. Give me the ability to communicate clearly the things that you've taught us. And let it be an equipping and encouraging time for all of us here. Pray that your glory will be reflected and that we will be edified. In Jesus' name. So, disaster at church, an aftermath of leaders' moral failure. Um, some of you don't know who I am. I'm um, Warren Lamb, director and professor at the Cooper Bible Institute, seminary for the lay person in Vancouver, Washington. Vancouver, Washington is, we jokingly say, we're the southwest Washington suburb of Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. That was a Columbia River divides the two states. I can actually see Portland right there. Uh, I was currently serves the area coordinator for Washington and Oregon, um, and I'm the director and director <coughs> counselor at uh, Treatment Love Biblical Counseling Center. Um, I'm the recovered psychologist that Dr. Welker referred to a bit. I'm also a NANC refugee, if any of you are still involved in that. Blessings. Today what we want to do is want to examine both the immediate impact and long-term effects on members of the congregation, the aftermath of the moral failure of one of its leaders. As biblical counselors, we all seek to provide scripturally sound help, hope, and encouragement to those facing the woundedness of ministerial treachery. There are a few things that have long-term damaging effect on the members of any Christian fellowship than the moral failure of one of the leaders, especially when it's a pastor. Um, and we're not talking simply about the fact that there's been moral failure. That's damaging enough, but then how it's handled by the church. Mm -hmm. The world cries out, the people cry out, hypocrisy, phonies, self-righteous fools. And too many times the mishandling of the leader's moral failure compounds and adds to the pain. <coughs> Whether pedophiles, serial adulterers, those who misuse church authority and discipline, serial plagiarists, headlines and blogs are filled with earned outrage and indignation of not simply the acts, but the church's response. There's a, I deal with a lot of after, long-term aftermath. Um, like right now, there's uh, back in mid-80s, there were, does anybody remember the shepherding movement? Okay, well there was a church in Portland area that was like the anchor point for that. And when that all disintegrated, people scattered and um, some of the people that I'm counseling today were children in that church when it all happened. And they ended up going to churches where there was spiritual abuse going on beyond as well. So we have, basically we have this compounded. And now they're in their 30s and 40s. And we're still dealing with the residual effect of that, that treatment. So it can be very, very long term. And one of the young men, um, he talks about City Business Church. He has a blog there, I mean, just completely embittered. And uh, I'm actually working with part of his family. This is our mandate. The, for our counseling center, this is our ministry philosophy. We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are in discipline and unruly. In other words, if they're rebellious, get after them. Comfort the discouraged and fearful. Help and strengthen the weak and be patient to it all. This last part sometimes is really hard. Um, the First Thessalonians 5.14. If we can keep this in mind, every time we're sitting in a counseling situation, we're dealing with somebody who primarily fits one of those categories, but they can also be shifting among those, depending on what you're talking about and how you're talking about it. So being really prayed up, praying all the whole time, I tell our counselors, silence is not your enemy. 
There are times when you just need to sit quietly and ask the Lord, what do I say now? What do I do now? And wait. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're dealing with the weak. Oh, shoot. Okay. Uh, uh, this, my slide is backwards. Hmm. All right. Uh, let me go back. Okay. On October 15th, 2014, one of the biggest names in the evangelical circle stepped down from this multi-campus megachurch. It was long overdue. I've been working with two former pastors and elders and their families from that church since 2007. Seven years before he stepped down. They were severely mistreated in many ways, lied to, gossip, rumor, all kinds of things happened. And some of these things ended up in the newspaper. They're just now getting comfortable with going back to be part of the church fellowship. Mm -hmm. On Monday, November 1st, 2015, I received a series of phone calls from people in my area whose pastors stepping down had been announced at all three services the day before. <clears throat> I was one of several that warned of the possibility of this coming 12 years ago. And uh, we were not listened to. Our counseling team is actually working with several families um, I was actually supposed to be going on staff at that church 13 and a half years ago. And I, oh, I, there were things I'm like, oh, no, 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 we're not doing this. We can't do this. Mm -hmm. So I started talking to some of the, some of the folks there. Talking. I met with a pastor. My wife and I met with a pastor and his wife. Talked to some of the associates. Talked to the board. And I'm like, kids, this is a, this is a train wreck. And then, just recently, July 11, 2016, the elders of a megachurch in South Carolina announced that they had to ask their famous family pastor to step down due to moral failure. These are just three situations. Um, sadly, there are hundreds and hundreds of stories like these just in the last 10 years. Year after year, the number grows. And I've personally been involved in nurturing over 2,000 comments congregations through the wreckage left in the wake of serial adultery, pedophilia, spiritual abuse, drunkenness, drug abuse, mm -hmm. domestic violence, incest, thievery, and more. I get dozens of phone calls, some of you may as well, I get dozens of phone calls and have conversations and conferences with people like, we got this thing, not really sure how to handle this. And my, my, I'm like, how is it you don't know how to handle this? The word tells us what to do with this kind of stuff. But there's a hesitancy. Mm -hmm. When a leader within the church is found to be guilty of moral failure, the primary sense everyone has is a sense of betrayal. Mm -hmm. They feel like they're a prisoner trapped and with no means of escape. Betrayal is the number one thing people talk about. When a leader fails morally, they betrayed Christ. Mm -hmm. They betrayed their position in the church. They betrayed the honor of the body of Christ. They betrayed the sense of integrity. They betrayed family, friends. They betrayed themselves. Mm -hmm. Self-seeking sin and idolatry have replaced every loyalty they've ever proclaimed or pretended. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very long road back from betrayal. It is one that can be successfully traveled. <coughs> but both betrayer and the betrayed need a great deal of prayer, surrendering to Christ and the indwelling Christ, completely replacing what they think about and believe with the truth and time. Lots and lots of time. One of the word pictures I use is if you have a if you have a, a glass and you drop it, how long does it take you to drop a glass and break it on the kitchen floor? Mm -hmm. But how long does it take you to clean that up? Mm -hmm. How many weeks later do you barefoot in the kitchen get this little tiny sliver of glass that you didn't even notice there? Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking at. It's sh there's a shattering mm -hmm. that takes place. Truth has been assassinated in the streets, and people don't know what to believe anymore. 
they hold on to the rudimentary aspects of the faith, faith most likely, but beyond that, they can't sort through everything this leader has told them and taught them and represented as, thus saith the Lord. Well, how do I even know anymore? How do I know? Because everything that they have assumed has now been brought into question. And that's whether it's within the church or within the family, but when you're dealing with the church, you're, you have this spiritual dynamic because someone is standing up there saying, I represent God most high. I'm speaking God's mind and heart into your lives. But now what? How do they even know? What really is the truth? They need a great deal of time and a great deal of patience learning how to go through that reassessment and reevaluating and sifting everything that they think they believe. It's important that we don't have expectations for how long each person and a congregation as a whole is going to take to grieve and heal. Because there's no master template for this. Now, aside from betrayal, the most common emotions experienced by the wounded are shock. First, they just can't believe it. Then confusion, trying to figure out what all is true. Then denial, say, well, that that decade really can't be true. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I just don't believe that. Because they don't want, they just don't want to believe that anyone that they've trusted and known and loved, maybe gone to dinner with, maybe gone on vacations with, they don't want to believe that this is possible. And then dismay, just like, what do we do? We get to a place where Eeyore sounds like an optimist. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, oh, and then anger. And there's a mix of righteous and human anger at play here. There's a righteous indignation <coughs> over the injustice, the violation of God's moral code. But then there's that personal anger. I've been wounded. I've been betrayed. And then, of course, severe doubt. And the thing is, is that you have this avalanche of emotions that just buries people. Far too many churches mishandle a leader's moral failure. And the whole place ends up mm. devastated. Why is this so? What seems to be the most common reason for mishandling of moral failure is both that both churches and individuals try to self-protect. They try to preserve whatever they possibly can. You, but often it's at the expense of those who have been victimized. And that's, we have to understand, people have been victimized. One of the things I see often is churches trying to protect their giving, their support, their attendance, their public image, their reputation. It's not about what's good and right and best. It's about what's expedient. But lost in that protection are the people who in the future might be abused by a serial pedophile. Spouses that will see their marriage ripped apart by a habitual adulterer. An ever-growing number of church attenders will be hurt by the ongoing spiritual abuse of leaders who seem to be given over to pride and anger and not stopped. Like I was talking earlier, right now I'm counseling two of four adult children of a pastor who was a serial adulterer <coughs> who they couldn't figure out why every year and a half to two and a half years they, had, they just suddenly were leaving a church and moving and moving and moving. He's alluded to past adulteries, only admitted to one, and this is, what, six years ago. So there's no real re full repentance from this yet. So there's a tightrope over a sea of hazards that Jews must walk in order to properly deal with the moral failure of a leader in the church. As biblical counselors, we may be asked to step in and guide the process. This, think of it as spiritual intensive care unit work. Okay? They can't do anything for themselves for a time. They need help, support, and guidance. They need someone to come in and say, okay, this is the next thing we need to look at. And only one thing at a time. Because they're already emotionally and mentally overloaded. They're spiritually taxed. And one of the things I often encourage churches to do is just come together 
and quietly have an open prayer time. Mm -hmm. Just come together and have an open prayer time. Allow anyone to pray anything they feel they need to pray. No, you shouldn't think that or you shouldn't say that. Or allow them to process <laughs> this. Because this is what we know about trauma. Is that if, if people are able to process through verbally talk about traumatic things within the first 48 hours, the long-term ramifications are minimized. You see the difference between the New York Police Department and the Fire Department in New York. The police Department had people come in and help the, the police officers after 9-11 go through and talk through everything that they dealt with. The, the, New York, the Fire Department did not. They had a mental health nurse who said, oh, they don't need to do that. And the dramatic increase in domestic violence, drug and alcohol abuse, suicides, um, all those kinds of things was, was remarkably different. So giving people the opportunity to do this, but do it in a safe environment. They, in, it just, and not make it a have to. We're, gonna, we're, we're all gonna gather, we're gonna come together, and we're just gonna pray together. Okay? Because the very first thing we wanna get them doing is leaning into God. Focusing on the nature and character of God. Authentic prayer. It says, don't be anxious, but instead, with all prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that's beyond human comprehension will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Give them the opportunity to have that authentic conversation with God. We need to have an effective and biblical strategy for responding. So it's multifaceted and it looks like this. We want to protect Christ's lambs. Number one thing is establish safety. We have to make sure that they're not vulnerable to being harmed anymore. The offender has to be confronted. Now we all know the biblical mandate for what that looks like, right? How many of you are part of churches that you have never seen church discipline exercise. Anybody? I know people, I know pastors who, will, who have told me, well, you know, I just wait for the Holy Spirit to move on someone and I'm, what? I don't know, I've got this manual in black and white that says this is, these are the steps. Because then you become a co-conspirator. You become like the French in World War II, you now are collaborating with Stop the offenses. That person ha can have no more access to anyone within that fellowship to do any more harm. Prevent future offenses if possible. We're going to talk about this a little bit more. But one of the things we see, like a youth leader or a worship leader, will get involved in sexual sin. And they just go to another church. Ensure the church's integrity. Ensure the church's integrity. Integrity is not about reputation. What's integrity? Steadfast reliability. If you look at a bridge and you say, and you, you, someone says, ah, you see on the news, the, the integrity of that bridge is in question. You're not going to want to cross that bridge. But it was tested and the integrity of the bridge is sound. That's what needs to happen is the church, because we're not talking about just that local fellowship. We're talking about the body of Christ in general. How we handle this, the world is watching. We say we have answers. Are we following through with those? And then protect the reputation of Christ. That would be fit. Rule of thumb, is our approach compatible with how the Gospels show Christ himself demonstrated dealing with sin and moral failure and how he instructed disciples to do so whenever addressing sin within the body, especially within the leaders of all. Is it consistent? Now, who did Jesus get after? The self-righteous. <coughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. But that's what we want to, we need to watch out for. So there, there are really 10 key questions that we need to ask. And we, not just ourselves, but churches that we're, we're involved with helping navigate through this. And this is kind of the meat of this. 
First thing is, is it reportable? Any situation, any situation at all, without exception, where a child has been sexually or physically abused must be reported to the police at once. There is no protecting the perpetrator. None. It cannot happen. I have known churches that have not reported and been held culpable and negligent. Churches have been shut down and lost everything because they did not report. The thing is, is that it's, that's also important for the child and the child's family. Is, is there really a defender? Is there really someone to stand up for the weak to be a voice for the voiceless? That's what we say that Christ is about. We say the church is about. Is that true? That's part of protecting the integrity of the church. If money is involved, it probably needs to be reported. Has, has a crime been committed? What are, what's the mandate in Romans 13 for us? to obey the governing authorities. If we live in a jurisdiction where there's a law that says this is a crime, we're obligated to get the authorities involved. Because even though we want to help people through this, there are legal ramifications and consequences. Grace doesn't avoid consequences. Grace and forgiveness doesn't mean no consequences. We actually do grow a grave in, in, in justice to those left behind and the person who's responsible. Remember that one of the gifts of grace that we're honor bound to give is the gift of consequence. Anybody ever had consequences in your life that God used to turn you in the direction you needed to go? Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's how I came to know the Lord in the first place. Anybody else? <laughs> Anytime I've gotten off in the pucker brush, that's how God's brought me back. Oh, you do not want to be out here. Cons gift of consequence. If it's a matter that does not involve the authorities, the offender simply flees the church after their offense has been revealed. We owe it to the rest of the body of Christ to not in any way enable them to simply go to another church and continue their sin and harm in others. Well, you know, this, we really can't tell. Yes, we can. We have a mandate, twice expressed by Paul in Ephesians 4, putting aside all malice, that's the heart, speak the truth to one another in love. That's our debt, that's our obligation. And later it says, speak the truth to one another, for you are members of one another. The one another's in the New Testament are what define the body of Christ. Without one another's, we've got no church. Well, that's not just our little microcosm, it's the church in general. How would you feel if you're in, in, a, in a church fellowship and find out that this worship leader who now is having an affair with a piano player, both of them married to somebody else, this is not the first time. And I've sat in court where a, a youth leader has been charged with inappropriate sexual activity with a minor in Oregon, well, come to find out, they, that's how, why they left the church they were in in Texas. And the church in Texas knew where he went. It's wrong. We can't do that. There may be a limit as to what can be done, but we, we can't, what can be done must be done. We need to do what we can to prevent them from being one of those people who go from church to church, fleeing discipline and accountability and leaving a trail of wreckage in their wake. Where's the credibility for the church and the gospel? It's gone. Was the sin discovered or self-reported? How did their immorality surface? Were they discovered or did they come forward on their own? This can be, not always is, but can be a, a first indica indicator as to whether or not true repentance is at work. Well, it's not always the case. But some leaders have self-reported when they knew they were about to be found out, they wanted to minimize the consequences and make it appear that they were repentant. 
A situation where someone confesses and repents because they were caught after months or years of covering up is a very different case than someone who comes forward on their own, out of their own conviction. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot more to work with with that person than the other person. Because the other person's heart has been hardened. And it takes a while for that to be softened up. Is this serial sin or an anomaly? There's a significant difference between a serial adulterer and somebody who's guilty of a one-night stand type of affair. If you've got uh, someone who's made immoral behavior a way of life and someone who's foolish who made a series of wrong choices and fallen into the trap the enemy's laid for them, there's a significant difference there. Both of those paths resulted in sin and hurt and harm. But the first is a result of serious malice of forethought. Or the second is a bunch of foolishness. Somebody who's ser who's, who has serious malice of forethought, that's a lot more work to deal with than somebody who's fallen into a series of bad choices. The level of damage and the depth of depravity between the two is significant as well. Another thing is that when we, we're looking at fruit in keeping with repentance over time, right? Well, there's going to be a lot more expected of someone who is, who's guilty of serial sin than someone, this is an anomaly for them. Yes, we're required for them to keep them with repentance. But the unique incident is one thing. But somebody who's done it repeatedly over years, it's a whole other story. Does the offender show a contrite heart? and humble willingness to submit to the judgment of church leadership. Even that word judgment makes people cringe, but we are required biblically to judge within the body of Christ. Anybody ever read 1 Corinthians 5 and 6? A contrite heart. This is something that's important. All the counseling that you do when you're dealing with, with broken relationships, whether it's domestic oppression, abuse, you're dealing with something in the church, Underlying, underlying true repentance is a contrite heart. Okay? Now, a contrite heart, this is a working definition that we use. A contrite heart is where the perpetrator of the sin has a wide open willingness to accept the responsibility for the evil suffered by others as a result of their sin choices. No minimizing, no rationalizing, no justifying, no blame shifting, no scapegoating, no denial, no excuses. No excuses. And when somebody says, well, it was just, there's nothing just about it. Mm -hmm. Just is minimizing language. And apart from a contrite heart, there can be no true being in full agreement with God on the exact nature and character of the wrong, which <laughs> is what the word confess, homo legeo, in 1 John 1, 9. We have a, it's a legal term. We have a, a similar term we use in American jurisprudence, but it's derived from the Latin instead of the Greek. It's allocute. Have you ever watched any, like, oh, was it Law and Order or anything? The judge will say, we understand that the, the prosecution has agreed to a reduced sentence in exchange for a guilty plea. Yes, Your Honor, on the condition that the defendant allocute himself, verbally admit to the exact nature and character of the wrong and accept full responsibility. That's the same term from 1 John 1 9. It's a legal term. And if somebody is not truly confessant with a contrite heart, there's no true repentance. And if there's no true repentance, there's no true forgiveness available. Because what is the, one of the biggest words in that whole 1 John 1 9 is the word if. If. Oh, we do not like the ifs in the Bible. But we have to be able to help people walk through this. Is a person truly contrite of heart, truly repentant? Then forgiveness and restoration are possible, and reconciliation are possible. But apart from that, you've got nothing to work with. Nothing. You add to this, an attitude of accepting the consequences for their actions and a humble willingness to accept whatever judgments and action plan leadership 
lays out for repentance, fruit in keeping with repentance, and future restoration. Fruit in keeping with repentance. Paul does an amazing job of encapsulating that for us in Ephesians 4.28. Let him who steals, steal no longer. But instead, let him toil with his hands so that he may have something to give to those who are in need. So he stopped the bad behavior replaced it with the opposite righteous behavior, and he's done it long enough, over time enough, that what? He's paying his weight, he's paying his old debt, and the motivation for what he's, why he's doing is even changed. That shows fruit in keeping with repentance over time. Okay? If I plant an acorn in the ground, one day that's going to be an enormous oak tree, but not today. One day, when it gets here, right, I'm saying, oh, one day we're going to be able to hang a rope swing in this tree. But not today. Fruit in keeping with repentance over time. Oh, shoot. Does the offender show regret or remorse? Oh, two kinds of sorrow. Second Corinthians 7.10. Okay? The sorrow of God leads to repentance without regret. Sorrow of the world ends in death, right? Basically, this is the formula we use. Regret is sorrow over what my sin cost me. Remorse is sorrow over what my sin cost someone else. Remorse prepares a person and makes possible repentance and restoration. Regret, on the other hand, simply prepares one to follow the same path of sin again. They figured out how to make peace with it. Regret or remorse, what's the difference? That's what you need to look for. Is restoration to fellowship possible? And how about restoration to leadership? Was the offense a completely disqualifying, of a completely disqualifying nature for, for the ministry role? Or are they restorable? I found that someone who's unfaithful to the spouse one time in the context of years of commitment can often be restored. A serial offender cannot, or perhaps more to the point, ought not. Because I've seen that happen. Six months later, a guy, I mean, a guy has been, I'm dealing with a situation like that right now, okay? 23 years of marriage, just discovered that he has been having an affair with a married woman. Okay, Well, it's on top of all, four and a half years this has been going on. And the only way it was discovered or found out was her husband was visiting his mother in another state and the, 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 this man and this woman were involved in a project, long-term project, the church building project and, and stuff in the church. And so her husband is showing pictures on his phone to, they have a shared picture thing. Anybody use like Amazon Cloud or any of that kind of thing? Where, yeah, my wife and I have that. So any pictures I take, she sees. So he's flipping through showing his mom these pictures and all of a sudden there are these screenshots of text messages from her phone from the guy she's having the affair with. So suddenly everything is out in the open. Talk about embarrassing. Well, guess what? This happens at a time when she's eight months pregnant. So not only is the family devastated, the church is just ripped apart. And this is like eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago. So this is all very, very fresh. And the first thing I get is, we're not really sure what to do about this. Are you kidding me? What do you mean you're not sure what to do about this? You know, it's like, how do we get to this place? How do we get to this place? We don't know what to do with this. And Joe, I know you've got a bunch of those. Happened many times. <laughs> right. Anyway, sure. this is one of those things that just gets me wound up. Anyway, yeah. as you can tell, right? I argue often that any offense against a child is grounds for permanent removal from any type of ministry with children, especially when it's sexual in nature and maybe even ministry altogether, because pedophilia is controllable, but has never been shown to be curable. 
they will always have the sexual attraction to children. Well, here's why this is so significant. Because if someone is attracted to an other adult sexually, that other adult has full freedom of choice to make a decision on whether to be, to cooperate with that sin or not, and they will answer to the Lord for that. A child doesn't have that ability. The child cannot and will not be held responsible for participating in that. They're not culpable. So, and I, this is one of those really dark areas that I've dealt with a lot of the years, and I've never seen it turn out well when they allow that person back in the industry. <clears throat> it's like, um, like saying, okay, um, you get, you get, uh, you get drunk with whiskey all the time. So we're going to let you work in the liquor store, but only in the vodka section. I'm sorry. If the person shows the kind of authentic repentance that pursues restoration, then we need to have the resolve and have the church family to have the resolve. To have any and all discipline be restorative and not punitive. Okay? Read 1 Corinthians 5. Paul is very clear. I've surrendered this one to Satan. For what purpose? So even though in their flesh they may experience torturous experiences, their soul will be saved. Imagine a rope a million miles long. The rope. And one end of it is like an eighth of an inch. It's bright red. Okay? The bright red part is this life. And the rest of the rope is the rest of eternity after we step out of this part of our existence. We focus so much on the red part of the rope that we forget the other part. The other part is the part that really matters. That's what we need to be looking at. Can this person be not only restored to fellowship, but primarily, can they be restored in their relationship with God? Too many churches pursue discipline that is meant to punish. It's vengeful. There's no redemption and restoration in vengefulness. We're not the final arbiter of God's justice. We are stewards of his justice in the temporal, but God is the eternal arbiter of his justice. Now, during the restoration process, it's usually wise to remove the person from any and all public platforms and leadership positions. We're not talking about sexual sin. It can be drunkenness. It can be... Um, misappropriation of funds, any kind of thing. We don't want to throw them out of the church if it's not necessary. What's the, what's the biblical prerequisite for casting somebody out? It's a lack of repentance, right? If there's a repentant part to this, if they, they're approaching repentance, I don't even know how to. That's one thing. But if they're sh shucking and jiving and dodging and oh no, they think they're made out of Teflon. Nothing's going to stick to them. You can't let them get away with that. Um, if they are kept in employment, it needs to be a behind the scenes and free of all spiritual responsibility. That's protecting anybody else from being harmed. Sometimes it's not possible. And now, another question that comes up, what about the length of time for restoration? Depends on a lot of things, including the kind of counseling that may be required for them and the people within the church. For matters of sexual immorality involving another person, I always recommend a minimum, a minimum of one year. Minimum. But I've never, I have never seen less than two years for sexual sin. Never. Because remember, sexual sin strikes at the very core of who we are. Seven, what stratagem is in place to communicate to others what has occurred? what is the ongoing plan. So again, this is about what is the integrity of the church? What is the reputation of Christ? Um, we need to communicate the situation only to those who need to know. Okay? And it's very delicate and difficult to work for because think of it, there are innocent parties involved in all of this. I was asked to come in and help a church and um, these people asked the pastor's wife to get up in front of the church 
and tell the church what her husband had been found to be guilty of. I'm like, are you people out of your mind? What are you doing? This woman was already wounded and betrayed, and now she's got this public humiliation. And she didn't do anything wrong. But they made a public spectacle out of it. We can't do that. We can't co-sign that. We have to tell people, don't do that. Protect the innocent. They, and the thing is, they may not wish unnecessary details to be involved. What about a family whose child has been abused in, in the church? Do we make this public knowledge to everybody? Not if it's not necessary. What about the wife of an unfaithful spouse? What do we do with that? How about the adult children? What about the children in the home? Like I, like I said, I work with pastors' families a lot. I can't even tell you how many times I work with pastors' families. And here, the, 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 they're, they're doing and believing everything that that's been, they've been taught, but yet they have this public shame foisted on them. They, don't, they haven't even done their own healing, and they're having to deal with rejection from their fellows. Um, so we have the family of the offender, and they've been victimized too. Um, why would you, we just don't want to embarrass the, the daughter of an adulterous man? We just don't want to do that. It's not her fault. <clears throat> there, like I said, there are times that it's unavoidable, but the innocent need to be protected whenever possible. So best practices. Best practices demand that only necessary details are shared, and only with those that is necessary to deal with within their relevant circles. So what that means is the wider the influence in ministry, the wider the disclosure needs to be. If it's a senior pastor, obviously, that's full frontal exposure for the entire body. The thing is, is we, have, we can be clear without being overly because we all know the fascination people have with sin, right? It's almost like we have these special taste buds for it. Right? Um, it. We don't need to get into the theology of that, but the enemy loves to taunt and titillate. What does James tell us? We're just drawn away and enticed by the things that we desire. Um, and one of the things that we love to see <laughs> I'm not as bad as somebody else. Mm -hmm. The woman you put here with me, the serpent, you know, we've been doing that a long time. Um, so let's say you've got a person who's a small group leader and something has happened within that group. The whole church doesn't necessarily need to know all that. If it's a small fellowship, everybody's going to. But there may be ministries in that church that have absolutely no connection with any of the people in this. So is it, we have to ask and answer the question, what's the point? What's the point? Is this to stop the hemorrhaging? Is this to be able to put an end to question, doubt, question, uncertainty, and be able to start saying, yes, we're handling this. This will, this is stop, you're safe, you're protected. It cannot be vengeful. So, um, sometimes, though, the whole world needs to know. Sometimes the whole world needs to know. <coughs> but that's, that's not even our thing. We don't call a press conference. We don't call a press conference. If it's something that's criminal and unchargeable and all that other kind of stuff, that's not our purview. We don't handle that part of it. As far as the details of the offense itself, we can be direct and truthful, but not sensational. Okay? We can be clear without being over detailed. And I, it's important not to share anything that caters to unwholesome sexual interests of others. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing that titillates. Um, also, in fairness to, to that person, if, the, if their offense wasn't sexual, it's important that we don't use language that suggests that it was. So, like, let's say, it's like the moral, term moral failure, the very first thing we go to in our minds is sexuality, sexual sin, right? Mm -hmm. Well, but what if it's financial or some other matter? We need to use language that pulls people's minds away from the sexual. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, we could say there was inappropriate handling of finances. Okay? 
that's clear without being overly detailed. And now people may run away with that. You know, gossip, oh, the church is bankrupt, or, you know, we put a stop to that too. But we have to be able to protect and preserve. Speak the truth, do it in love. Don't sensationalize. Also, if it's a one off incident, we need to couch, the, we need to make sure we don't couch the disclosure in ways that make it seem like it's more salacious than that, than, you know, it's an ongoing, long term thing. The bottom line appropriate disclosure, appropriate people. Okay. What do we do now with ministering to the wounded in the wake of the wounded's resignation and discipline? Because without realizing it, they've been preyed upon. There's a wolf in been in, there's a wolf in sheep's clothing that's been in their midst and nobody had any idea. Powerful picture, right? This will be by far the longest and most involved aspect of the entire undertaking. When a pastor resigns or is discharged due to moral failure, the havoc wreaked in his way can, can have a ripple effect for years. Like I was mentioning, I'm still dealing with people who've been impacted from the 80s in a church. Um, Christ of the Lambs have been deceived, lied to, betrayed. They're demoralized and shattered with more doubts and questions and certainty than answers. Overwhelmed by the challenge of how to deal biblically with the aftermath of the egregious sin of one they trusted and relied on to teach them and shepherd them in Christ's name, they have little, if anything, they can feel certain about other than their anger and grief. They'll feel preyed upon, disregarded, intentionally deceived, taken advantage of, made fools of, seen by their former leaders, people of no real worth. They'll, they'll say there's been fakery and hypocrisy. The perpetrator will just, he'll just be this big dark shadow in front of all of so. And they'll feel ashamed for having even been, how could I have been so fooled? How could I let, my, how could I let that happen? They'll take on the responsibility for being fooled. Well, guess what? Deceivers deceive. Liars lie. Manipulators manipulate. That's how they hide in plain sight. Um, shepherding wounded sheep after the shepherd has shown himself to be a wolf is a long and difficult process. Like I said, I've never seen the process take less than two years uh, in some, in, for sexual sin. Often it takes <coughs> even 10 years later, the aftershocks can still be rippling through the congregation. I have people that talk to me, uh, I helped a church back in 99, People from that church still, oh man, I, you know, I still remember the day, you know, it felt like the, the, the walls came down in our church. You know, we're, we're, we're approaching 20 years now, and there's still. You know, uh, they will need the opportunity to talk through the trauma they've experienced. However many times they need to do it, they need to be afforded the opportunity. Protections need to be put in place, though to discourage vengeful gossip, spreading rumors, unforgiveness and bitterness, and the kind of discussions and fuel the fires of animosity, and then do not bring healing. You know, remember, this is Christ's body. This is the family of God. We do things differently. We don't shoot our wounded. Contrary to what the world thinks. Contrary to what many of us have seen and maybe experienced. The primary focus needs to be placed on the nature and character of God and moved away from the evil that has been perpetrated. Too often we focus on what went wrong. Well, that's all we're going to see. That's all we're going to be able to focus on. I call it turning your butt around. Very often we say, yeah, God is working, but this happened. No, turn that butt around. Yes, this happened, but God is working. Even though this person betrayed us, not everyone did. And we have people within the body of Christ. We have leaders within our fellowship who are doing good, godly things and ministering to the people in ways that are really helpful. Don't focus on what's broken and bad. Go 
That's because that's all you're going to be able to see. What we focus on is what we hit. The, the greatest road hazard in the world when a teenage boy's learning to drive is a pretty girl walking down the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. They'll drive right at them, right through parked cars. You can see them. What we focus on is what we hit. What we saturate our minds with is what we believe and live. The greatest balm to the wounded souls of the betrayed is the assurance that the good, omniscient, omnipotent, loving, gracious, merciful, ever-present, providentially sovereign, protecting, delivering, guiding God, whose timing and trajectory are flawless. It's the same God who created each of them in his image, created each of them for the purpose of loving them and one day inviting them to share his glory, who has invited them to be adopted as his child who desires his absolute best will for their life so much he sacrificed himself to make it possible. This God is the God who's still reigning and personally involved in the journey. That's where the focus has got to be. Who is God? Who is God? And who are you in relationship to him? That's what it always comes back to. Returning them to their spiritual roots. What plans have been made to see that their ministry responsibilities are handed off in a gracious and healthy way? The one another in ministry of the church are its lifeblood and are vital to the health of the fellowship and the individual members of it. Again, without the one another, we don't really have the church. By your programs, everyone will know you're my disciples. Nope. <laughs> By your bus ministry, your Sunday school, nope. By how you love one another. And biblically, love is a passion and desire for God's best for someone else, even if it costs you. That's how God did. If there's no one person or even a number of individuals up to the task of picking up the ministry responsibilities or handled by the phone, a decision will need to be made about the viability and importance of those, those ministries, those responsibilities. Do we really need this right now? Do we really need this right now? Is this really important? In the case of Bible teaching, of course, that can't be forsaken. So oftentimes, recruiting another shepherd from outside to come in and just teach the word. They're not personally involved. They don't have a dog in the fight. So they have an objectivity. They come in, they can just speak the truth of God's word into And that's the number one thing people need to hear is the truth. Another thing that this is helpful in, it abates suspicions of and accusations of politics and inviting. Healing and restoration of the wounded can then be the focus. It's also important that anyone involved in any type of teaching or leadership be given permission to modify the rules for a while. Everyone has experienced trauma in this disaster. Trauma impacts some people more significantly than others. Allow folks to focus on what they have, have the capacity to deal with. I just, I can't do all of it anymore. Just worn out. Okay. Okay. So let's bring it down to what you really feel you have the bandwidth for. We'll, focus, we'll do that, and the rest of it we're not going to worry about. Because you know what? 100 years from now, no one's going to remember or care anyway. Have them thinking that future, that, that future possibility is a part of it. So when we allow focus, folks to focus on what they have the capacity to deal with, time, their strength and resilience return, and they and the fellowship end up stronger and better for it. Anybody ever worked out, worn out your muscles? Did you feel stronger and better for it afterwards? Yes. It wasn't hurting so good at the time, but later on, yeah, it was worth it. And then, is there a plan for gracious restoration and celebratory approach to receiving the repentant back into the fellowship? This ministers to everybody, especially the wounded. I'll tell you why. If a person is able to be restored due to the nature of the offense and the repentance, they ought to be fully restored with joy and celebration. Because this is a kingdom victory. This is a kingdom victory. This is a trophy on God's shelf, if you will, on his mantle. It's important for the watching world, but more important for the body of Christ. How do we deal with sin? on the front end. How do we deal with it in the aftermath? Because we talk about grace and love and forgiveness and the cross of Christ, but do we really live that out? Do we show people how to do that? Do we 
apply that grace and truth? Grace is our secret weapon against the world's value system. So we can't cheapen it in giving it or in receiving it. We don't cheapen it by saying, oh, well, you know, God's grace. No, no, no. But we, but we can't withhold it when it's due. Those who've fallen and have been restored are to be received in the community as just that. No scarlet letter on their ch chest that says, I'm the heinously fallen and now restored. No, that's not forgiveness and restoration. Because that's, um, remember, when we're dealing with matters related to child abuse, it's another matter entirely. Um, and you just don't let them back in the kind of ministry that you've done. So, I'm going to do another time. Almost, I'm going to make it. Okay, concluding thoughts. There's an inclination in the church to keep quiet about things that go wrong in the church. But that often hurts more than helps. Hiding sin never avails of God's blessings. If the image is more important than the people within that body, that, that, that the image then is an idol. When we're dealing with families of abuse, we talk about abusive and narcissistic families, where the image of the family is more important than the individual members of the family. So their, their legitimate needs are expendable for the sake of the image. We can't do that. Because it tells people within the church, our image as a church is more important than what's happened to you. I don't know, the picture of Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well comes to my mind. Or the woman caught in adultery. Those are the pictures that come to my mind. You are more important than the image. And we have to understand that secrecy and privacy are different. Secrecy protects sin, privacy protects people. keep things private, we don't keep secrets. Christ-like grace is forgiving, yet also understand that sin has consequences. Remember that gift of consequences. We don't think of consequences as a gift. I mean, come on, from the garden we've been trying to avoid consequences at all cost. But the blessing of consequences. Redemption came through consequences of sin. Emotions will be unpredictable and very strong in the wake of disaster like a leader's moral failure. Emotions are not right or wrong. It's what we do with them. Emotions are real. Don't invalidate. You shouldn't feel that way. We don't talk like that. What you're feeling now is a normal, emotional reaction to what's happened. Okay? So what do we do now? What do we do? This is what I feel, but this is what's true. That's the number one antidote. This is what I feel, but this is what's true. This is the word picture I often use. When we allow emotions to drive, it's like putting a drunk behind the wheel of a school bus. It's all over the road, and it doesn't turn out well for anybody. Emotions have a seat on the bus. They can be jumping on the back seat, waving at cars out the back window, but keep them away from the driver. Okay? They have a place. They're valid. But they don't get to run things. They're transient. They're here in a minute, and once they get what they want, they're gone. Okay? The truth is the truth. The thing is, we feel emotions. We don't feel the truth, because the truth has no emotional content. It just shows up. Okay? So we don't feel the truth. So we react to what we feel. We respond to what's true. We want response, not reaction. But there's going to be this emotional reactivity and this unpredictability. We need to be very fluid and hold real life lightly. Anybody ride horses? No? Okay. If you grab them on the reins, you're going to end up on the ground or into a fence. If you hold lightly to the reins, you can guide that animal very, very easily. Again, it typically takes at least a year for a church, for a church to recover to a fairly functional level after moral failure and two years to be high functioning sometimes longer, but I would give it one, one, I usually say one and a half to two years for the church to get to a place where it would be high function. 
they're not going to be undamaged, but they'll be high function. They'll, they'll develop a, a new culture because this is the next point, is that the culture of the church has now been redefined. So we need to allow them to develop that new culture. The non-offenders in leadership can become easy targets for misdirected anger after this kind of disaster hits the church. And one of the reasons for that, we find this often when we're dealing with survivors of abuse. The non-offending parent is often the one that is the, the offended child feels the greatest animosity toward because they're safe. The other person isn't. So it's safe to, to vent my anger and to do all this. And they don't think of it. It's not a conscious decision. It's just an emotional reaction. So we have to know that. Um, there are a few situations in the church which require greater leadership than we're going to deal with more failure of a leader or a staff member. The affected fellowship will need ongoing prayer within and amongst its membership. Prayer and the Word of God are the two most powerful allies that they can have. And this type of disaster is best dealt with in the same way we help survivors of abuse, with patience, encouragement, and speaking the truth in love. Reinforce with them that it's not their fault. Even if there's things they could have seen or done, guess what? The responsibility fully relies on the person who made a choice to willfully sin. That's where the responsibility lies. And that's one of the greatest ministries, ministries of truth that you can bring to people. Because the person who sinned, the seeds for their moral failure were already there. They fed them, they watered them, they nurtured them. You did not. It's not your fault. You're not guilty. God one day is not going to ask you, why did you let that person do this? That's not going to be on your exit interview, so don't worry about it. 